Yorana et bienvenue aux entrevues Inside the Doc du FIFO 2022 où nous avons la chance d'échanger avec les réalisateurs et réalisatrices sélectionnés au festival cette année. Aujourd'hui, nous recevons Larissa Berendt, réalisatrice de Maralinga Jaruja, sélectionnée en compétition au FIFO 2022. Yorana Larissa and uh, welcome to this interview of uh, Inside the Doc. Yama, it's so nice to be here. Thank you so much for doing this. So, uh, my first question, could you tell us about uh, the topic of Maralinga Jarucha? What does it deal with? So, it really looks at the uh, British um, uh, bombing, using nuclear testing, bombing the traditional lands um, of the people who live at Maralinga Jarucha. Um, and their perception of that. So there's been a lot of focus on the fact that those bombings took place. But this was really the first time that an uh, extensive documentary had been done that t tells the story from the perspective of the Aboriginal people of that place. So how did uh, the ID come to you to start this documentary? How, how did it all start? Well, that's a, such a great question because I think there's a real lesson in this for us as filmmakers. Um, I'd obviously known about this story my whole life because it was the most aggressive form of colonization that took place in Australia. But uh, how I came to make the film was the community themselves decided they wanted the, the story to be told. Um, and partly because the, our national broadcaster, the ABC, had commissioned a drama that kind of looked at the British Australian experience, but didn't include a First Nations perspective. And so in negotiating with that, um, about that, that project, um, they decided that they would put forward the fact that they wanted a documentary made that told their story. So this is a wonderful example of where the community has decided that it's time for them to tell their story. And I was just lucky enough through connections I had there to be asked to um, to direct it, but it was very much a community-driven decision to tell this story now. How long did it take from start to finish? Well, actually, when we got started, in terms of how long it takes a documentary, this was a fairly swift process. So it took less than 12 months, um, which included me going up and spending time not shooting a single frame, Uh, to hear the stories from the perspective of the people that were there so I could really get a sense of how they wanted to tell the story. And we had quite a bit of disruption to the filming process. Uh, it's a very traditional community, so if there was a funeral or a ceremony was taking place, we had to stop filming and get out and couldn't come back in until it was culturally right to do so. Mm -hmm. And then right at the end, there is a scene where you... Uh, see the community uh, uh, talking to the nurses. The nurses are, are giving them a debrief. That was just when we'd heard of this thing called COVID. So we actually were lucky we filmed right up until almost the week before the community shut down. So quite lucky that we had done very intensive filming. I think because the community had really known what they wanted to say and we'd done that prep work before I took a camera in, we were able to film it fairly quickly given the time frames. Um, so what were the most challenging part and the least challenging, challenging part of the production? Um, I think um, for me, most of the films that I've done, I've had a really long relationship with my subject matter. I've known them for years and years. I've worked with them through my legal work or my academic work. Um, for me, um, because I had some connections through the legal team that worked with the community, that's how they got my name and I was recommended, but I still had to go up and meet them. Um, and, you know, like most First Nations people, the communities are very shy. They suss you out for a very long time. So there's a lot of sitting and with silence and waiting for people to be comfortable to speak to you. Um, so building the trust was a, a challenge, but one that was very fulfilling and we could not have done the project without that. Um, I think 
because I wanted to tell the story the same way the community told it to me and be very faithful to their voice, they were really adamant that there was a whole discussion about their experience under colonization that happens before the testing and white audiences are only interested in the testing. So pushing the broadcaster to make sure that the story was told in a way the community wanted to tell it was one. And I guess things like the my key talent in the film was, was apparent to me immediately. Uh, and we have broadcasters here who like a, um, somebody who perhaps um, has clearer, more, more um, English and a more English way of speaking rather than the, the um, accent of somebody who's where English is their third or fourth language as, as the Maralinga Jarritja are. Um, so what, really the challenges weren't so much with the community. They were so generous and we had such a good relationship. It was more about pushing a broadcaster um, to accept the way Aboriginal people wanted to tell the story with the people who were most appropriate to tell it. Even mm. having the name Maralinga Jarritja, there's a reluctance to have language names as titles on the broadcasters because Australians find them hard to pronounce when they should really be pushed to learn and be respectful. So I felt there were some really good wins around being able to strongly advocate for the mm. community. So. Um, the challenges were were really on that side. Um, and I did learn a lot uh, just by listening. We have a wonderful saying here that I think resonates with a lot of First Nations that wisdom comes from from listening, not speaking. And I think as filmmakers, that's really good advice. Uh, it absolutely is. So why was it important to tell that story? Look, I think uh, for a range of reasons, this is a story that really speaks to how aggressively um, Australia was colonised and, and the experience of having nuclear testing is of course something that is an experience throughout the Pacific. Uh, and it is, a, it is a part of history that is being forgotten. And, uh, you know, I think it's a very important warning as we look to find technological um, advances to issues around us. You know, a lot of our government says they're relying on technology to fix climate change. Um, I think it's a reminder that there are no quick fixes to that. But at the heart of it, one of the things I'm really um, passionate about as a First Nations filmmaker is I guess I, I engage with what I would call strengths-based storytelling. The people of Maralinga Jarritja are not victims what happened to them was terrible and they were subjected to something really awful but i think one thing that comes through in the film for me is that these are the most resilient people on earth and when they say we've been here for over sixty-five thousand years what has happened to us in the last 200 is a blip because we will be here for the next sixty-five thousand years you know that's true and i think for me being able to celebrate the fact that the most um, devastating, literally devastating thing can happen to people and to their country, and they can build that back. You can see a strong society, a healthy community, people engaged very deeply in their traditional culture, very proud of that, back on country, healing that country. To me, that's a very important lesson. I feel almost emotional when I see how much the land has recovered from some of those sites. There are pl places that will not be accessible for something like 20 or 40,000 years because of the contamination. But in other parts, it's, it's awesome in the true sense of the word, how much the country has recovered. And, and for me personally, I, I feel there's something very moving about the fact that the country can heal itself. And once we remove ourselves from it, it is able to heal very quickly. And I think in these times, that's a very uplifting lesson. Oh, it, it sure is a, a great lesson, yeah. So, uh, of course, the topic of nuclear testing hits very close to home for us here in French Polynesia. Uh, my question is, uh, how, how strong is the awareness of this nuclear testing in Australian society today 
and education system? I think there's been a bit of a, a loss of the knowledge of that. Obviously, there was a really big anti-nuclear movement here in Australia during the time of the Pacific testing. Um, and, and interestingly, um, that movement was very closely linked to the Aboriginal rights movement. My parents were very politically active and I grew up around Redfern in Sydney, which is a very politically active um, community. And if we weren't marching for land rights on a Saturday morning, we were marching against nuclear uh, testing or nuclear disarmament, so, or for nuclear disarmament. So, so for us politically back at that time, those there was a, a greater awareness and i think because i was so aware of it growing up uh it's shocking to me now that we are um as a broader society losing that focus and that history is being forgotten very recent history too um more recently as you point out in in other parts of the pacific but even in australia this was the 1950s so very much within living memory of people um so I feel like one of the important things we do with um, these kind of films is is tell a story not only that hasn't been told before because people really didn't take the time to hear this perspective or tell it properly, um, but because we're in danger of forgetting um, this period. And, you know, it was a time when people used increasing tensions amongst world powers as an excuse for doing this kind of testing, uh, violating people's rights, violating their country, violating the landscape. And I guess one thing we would need to be wary of is as we see the world increasingly divisive, we get worried about how we are on the brink of a whole range of new um, tensions between countries, that this is a really salient reminder of what some of the cost of that can be. So I feel like it's always good to be remembering this history. And of course, the damage that's been done through nuclear testing has will sit with us for, for beyond generations. And, you know, that that is also something that we need to um, be reflecting on as we start to really understand more broadly what First Nations people have said all along, which is we are not, we don't oversee the environment, we are part of it. And nuclear testing is probably one of the really good examples of forgetting how interrelated we are to the ecosystems around us and taking them for granted and not looking after them. Oh, this is so fascinating and it sounds like us also a little bit. <laughs> So uh, my next question is, um, you know, um, watching the documentary, uh, it's, it's being told very clearly that the um, nuclear testing didn't only bring ecological disaster, it was also a, before that, a human and a, a cultural uh, disaster. So it's a, a, a huge disaster on many levels. Um, and you know, each year FIFO receives uh, and selects uh, films that deal with Aboriginal issues. Uh, how is the Aboriginal community doing now, today, in Australia? I know it's a, it's a very vast question, I'm sorry, but just, you know, just to g get a grasp. I, I think the, the answer to that is probably mixed. Um, what you see with the Maralinga Jarretcher, I think, is a really good example of what I would call the positive, which is we have seen a lot of communities that have been completely decimated through the process of colonisation, um, through being forcibly removed off their lands, not being able to speak their language, uh, not, being not being able to be taught their own history in schools. All of those things are we have a, around the country a renaissance of people going back and um, reclaiming culture. I mean, white Australians like to say Aboriginal culture was lost. Even where it wasn't practiced, it sits under the surface. So, you know, across the country, we see this cultural revitalization. Language has been, is, is being regenerated across the country in many ways. Lots of languages have been, um, are no longer spoken but uh, or have fluent speakers but there are a lot that are being revitalized as well 
uh, very big language groups being revitalized. And with that, because these things are so connected, practices like possum cloak making and weaving, all of these things that actually bring us together as a community and, and join us culturally are being rebuilt. There are some great examples like Maralinga Jarrettship, but there are other nations around Australia, Aboriginal nations that are building their own governance systems. So where you see this self-determination, I would call it, you see really positive change. There's an absolute co correlation. If you look nationally, statistically, there is still what, what we, we describe as a need to close a gap. Uh, shorter life expectancy, um, higher incidences of treatable diseases, uh, p p lower socioeconomic uh, conditions, uh, less less education, less home ownership, all of those. So there's still a way to go on that. But I guess for me, what I see with Maralinga Jarrettshire is where there is the space for the Aboriginal community to really take control of finding the answers to their own issues. Um, that's where we've seen the, the greatest, most positive um, responses. And that's why, for me, that's a very important part of the film as well. It's not about just about what happened and how bad it was. It is the miraculous, uh, inspiring way the community has regained control and, and continues to live in that uh, cultural tradition. So when Googling, Googling your name, uh, there's uh, an impressive body of, of work that emerged, you know, in academia, in classes, I in uh, publications, books, uh, and now uh, a documentary. I, I mean, I guess it's probably not your first one, but my question is, uh, as a native Australian woman, uh, director, how does it feel to carry the voices and the stories of your people in documentaries like uh, Maralinga Jarucha? I feel it's an enormous privilege, really. I, I, I feel um, really honored and, and Maralinga Jarucha particularly because this was a community that trusted me to come in and tell this very important story and that's really humbling. Um, and for me, you know, I started life as a lawyer because I wanted to change the world, you know. I'd, as I said, I grew up in a really politically active family. It was all about land rights. And, you know, my, my father and grandmother were parts of the stolen generation. So, you know, I was, I was a bit of a social justice warrior, even as a child. And I wanted to be a lawyer and change the world. And, you know, I guess one of the things that I've matured into is that, you know, as, as lawyers, you speak for somebody else when you advocate for them in court. You, you're taking their story and you're presenting it in a way where you hope you'll be able to get a good outcome for them. And my evolution into filmmaking has felt like a very natural progression from, I guess, understanding the importance of, as an advocate, as I continue to be, actually stepping back and creating a space for someone else to tell their story and appreciating the power of that to create social change. Hearing the story from the Maralinga Jarrettshire about what happened to them, of course, is a thousand times more powerful than hearing it from somebody else. So, so for me, um, it's felt like a natural progression in terms of the work that I do. Uh, but, but you always feel so humbled when someone opens up to you and tells you their story. And I think as First Nations people, where storytelling is such a critical part of our culture, you only get to hear cultural stories when you are ready to hear them or you have, um, you're being you told them because you're taking on a responsibility. I think we have an additional understanding as First Nations filmmakers of the obligation that comes with the privilege of being able to tell somebody's story. Yes, and um, I mean, it was inspiring to see the end of the documentary with all these people going back to their land, uh, regaining their land and, and also taking care of it, taking care of uh, the, the wildlife and rebuilding a community uh, that really cares about the land. And obviously, as people from the Pacific, native people from the Pacific, uh, whether it is us in French Polynesia or Aotearoa, Hawaii, uh, and Easter Island, Australia, uh, the land is extremely important. We have a special connection uh, with land. So my question is, how important is that relationship to the land um, with the Aboriginal people? 
I think one of the um, really profound parts of the story for Maralinga that really speaks as an answer to your question is that without country, it's not over dramatic to say that people die because in the story of the Maralinga Jaritja, when they were first forced off their land because the the um, uh, mission at Aldea where the water supply had, had been um, their main source of water, it had been their source of water since people lived there, began living there and co colonizers ruined that water source in decades. So you had that problem as well as the clearing off uh, of people for the testing to happen. And they were all moved down south. And the change in climate, the change in the soil, if you go up to Maralinga, the soil is really warm. When it's been a hot day, you can sleep on that ground and the ground's really warm. You go down south where people were moved to and they, they say in the film, it makes you old. I at first thought they said it was making you cold, but they say it makes you old because the grey um, earth is really cold. So people moved down there and most of them died of pneumonia. So it is in their, so, so in, in the oral histories of the area, there is a real link between being moving off country and, uh, you know, a, a, a massive number of deaths as people came to climates where they were not used to, didn't know how to um, be resilient against. Um, and, you know, these consequences were fatal. Um, it's an interesting thing because people try and dismiss the impact of the testing on the Maralinga by saying, well, hardly anybody died from the testing which again is not true as the film shows, but there's an attempt to minimize it. But if you look at how many people who were moved off that land did pass away because of diseases or medical conditions they wouldn't have got if they'd stayed where they were in the country they were used to in their own country. You know, there is a large number of people who died as a result of the testing. So to me, you know, you can see how people regain their strength, regain their dignity, regain uh, their sense of agency when they reconnect to their culture and take back on their traditional responsibilities. You know, as men and women, we, we feel more ourselves when we're responsible for something, you know, and we've got our role and our place. And First Nations people, we're very connected through our totemic systems, our kinship systems, to having responsibilities and roles in our community. So you regain all of that and you can see the pride that people have and their sense of self and their strength coming back when they're reconnected. But it is a reminder of just how devastating it is for a peoples to be moved off their, off their country and to have that connection uh, completely ripped apart to not be able to care for that country. And the interesting thing I'd just add to that is when those First Nations people aren't there to look after the country, the country gets sick too. You don't see the fire burning that regenerates the way it should. You can look at country that isn't looked after in traditional ways and see that it is not healthy country. And when you look at country that's been looked after by fire burning, by traditional knowledge um, and knowledge management, you can see that the, the canopies are higher, the, the, the landscape is cleaner, um, the regeneration is happening. So it's actually, not only do the people get sick, but the country gets sick. Uh, and it's a great reminder of how close that relationship is between people and land. That is fascinating. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, when shooting and working on the production of that documentary, um, uh, is there a big life lesson that you learned, a big message that, you know, you, you received from going in th those places and meeting all these people? I, I think for me, it reaffirmed how important it is to ensure that Aboriginal people have the ability, the space, to be able to determine their own future. All that we see that is positive up at Oak Valley and, uh, you know, in the communities up around Maralinga Jaritja are because the community has taken back control. They're the ones who've set up the appropriate medical services. They're the ones who've put the infrastructure in. 
they're the ones who do the the programs for rangers and, and you know when we say you know australian government say oh it's so hard to close the gap and it's hard to do things about indigenous health and indigenous education and we try all these things and they don't work they don't try everything and the thing that they never try is to give control back to aboriginal communities to do those things themselves and i think if there's a an overall takeaway it's that you give that control back to aboriginal communities and they can come back from the most horrendous disasters and uh, things that have been done to them and become healthy and thriving in a way that governments, colonial governments, will never be able to achieve. Um, that agency for me, when I see it as, as an Aboriginal woman, always makes me profoundly proud. Yeah, it's that native resilience, right? <laughs> Which is great because the really big plant out there is the spin effects and they call themselves spin effects people and it's one of the most hardiest plants in the world and to me it's a wonderful symbol that that plant that's so emblematic of that country is also a real metaphor for the people as well so um where was the film screened so far and how was it received by the public did really well actually there's always a bit of a um a false narrative if you like that indigenous films don't land well with australian audiences uh, but one of the things that was negotiated by the marilinga jaritcha as part of getting the documentary done was that it would screen on the national broadcaster at a good time at a prime time and before the drama series that was not about them. So they wanted their story first. Amazing, as a, you know, amazing community. Um, so because it was put on at a good spot, it did really well in terms of how it rated. But I guess the most important screening was out at Oak Valley. The community gathered around for the screening, um, had popcorn, had it outside and, uh, you know they lo they love the film and as a filmmaker you have lots of audiences that you want to appeal to uh you want to change minds you know i feel this is something for a broader audience it's important for lawyers it's important for policy makers it's a conversation for first nations people around the world but the most important audience <laughs> was um the people at oak valley so to get a tick from them was great and they they really do love the film. So that's been a wonderful outcome. Well, congratulations for all of that. Um, I have just one last question. Do you have a favorite mom moment that you could share from, from this experience? Um, I guess for me, uh, what was really wonderful, uh, and maybe it's a bit subtle in the film, when we took the photographs back to Oak Valley, First of all, although the community wanted the movie made, the docu whenever we turned a camera on, they all disappeared. No one wanted to be on the camera. So it was always very hard to get them to come out. You'll see that we put on food and have community events to try and capture the sense of community. When we, we put the photos out at Oak Valley, so not with the ladies at Yalata, but Oak Valley, I was worried we'd get one or two people and the number that turned up was lovely and surprising. But what was so special was that the two old men remembered the song from Uldia, the old mission, and they sing that and you see them teaching that song to the children. And that was the first time they had taught that song. And what you'd see from the end of the film is sadly one of those old men passed away since from between the filming and when the film came out. So for me, that was incredibly special that there was an, an, another bit of the culture that came back by seeing the photographs, remembering the song, teaching the song, and now the community know that song from Aldea, that very important cultural song. So if I had to pick one moment in a film that I really love, it's probably that. Well, thank you so much for sharing, sharing that with us and congratulations again for being selected uh, at FIFO 2022. Thank you so much. Donc, notre interview avec Larissa Berent, euh, réalisatrice de Maralinga Jaruja, touche à sa fin. Merci de l'avoir suivi. Vous pouvez retrouver ce film dans les salles du FIFO en présentiel pendant le festival ou sur la plateforme numérique euh, 
du FIFO 2022. Merci Maruru et euh, bon FIFO.